Welcome to episode four of the off season. Today we're in BDU7 gym in Dublin, where we're gonna be speaking to eight time All-Ireland winner, two time All-Star, Philly McMahon. Yes, Philly. Hey, How, How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice. Well, yeah. All good. Well, Welcome to episode four. Looking we to. are going to go for a bit of a chat in the park first. Okay. I don't know if you've seen episode one, episode two, episode three. A uh, bit of a chat and then we'll go up and show me the gym maybe and we'll have a chat upstairs, okay? Sounds good. Let's just dive into it. Happy days. Okay, Philly. So at the start of every episode, I like to dive into your underage career with your club, uh, Ballymun Kickums. You've always been with them from from underage, under eights, yeah? I have, yeah, yeah. Um, I played soccer when I was prior to that, and then the local uh, the local GA club, Kickhams, came to the primary schools to recruit young kids, and I was one of them, yeah. Good stuff, and under eights was your first grade, under tens? I, I think it was in uh, between nines and tens. Paddy Christie would have came to the school. He was very, uh, Paddy was very smart in how he recruited his players, so he'd come to the, the local school, he'd, knock on the door of the classroom and he'd call a couple of kids out yeah. and you'd always wonder, you know, could I possibly be one of them? You know, can I get away with not doing maths or English or whatever we were doing that day? And and it was intriguing. So he recruited really well that way. And all he'd do is he'd call you out and you'd be basically saying, look, we're training on Thursday at seven o'clock, make sure you're there. But you'd spend about 20 minutes trying to <laughs> say those things and, and right. essentially you're missing most of your class. So that's how you really got involved in it. And I'm sure there was a lot of lads too that jumped, yeah. in, jumped yeah. in as well. Yeah, we obviously had mates that were uh, were playing at the time and and I'd always kind of be intrigued of, you know, what to like. And yeah. But I was, um, I suppose soccer was my first sport. For all the Gale girls that are listening to this, they probably don't like that. But yeah, football, I played soccer when I was a kid and. That's pretty common in Dublin, isn't it? Soccer would be yeah, it's a big maybe... crossover. I played yeah. soccer, soccer for um, Ballymun United and, and Belvedere, and then I, I played uh, Horland for Satanta. I done boxing in Pappins, St Pappins, um, which is in Ballymun, and then obviously I played for Ballymun Kickham. So my, my parents obviously wanted to keep me busy and uh, keep me into as much sports as possible. Okay, so obviously over the last ten years, Ballymun has been Division One seniors. Um, we'll get on to that in a second. But in the grades under ten, under twelves, fourteens, well, up where I'm from in Ulster, that's where the grades would have went. Tens, twelves, yeah. fourteens. Was Ballymun Kickham's always Division One? Were they always going for championships at, at that at that level? In Dublin, you'd have like a north, at a certain age, you'd have a north side okay. league, let's say, and a south side league. Okay. So we were in the top divisions at that point. But then when they merged together. Uh, that's when you see the, the changes of what teams are playing Division One and Division Two. So we were Division One all the time, and we we done really well. But we, I, I suppose, we were kind of a group of lads that were kind of late developers. We were mixed between younger players playing with us because we just didn't have massive numbers, and we also had players that would drop off a lot because of stuff going at home or stuff going mm -hmm. on um, outside of sport. So. Uh, Paddy was very good at holding on to players, looking at the energy in particular that the Ballymun lads had and then mixing that really well with the Glasnevin players because Ballymun's catchment is Ballymun and Glasnevin. Right. So that merged really nicely together and we learned so much and we developed so many life skills b based off that, that chemistry between the two groups. But I suppose at the age of 17 into minor, uh, we actually got brought away to London on a trip. We played. Um, I think it was Strawberry Hill, is Strawberry Hill one of the colleges over there or Stra something like that? Sure. It was one of the colleges over there, we played a game and anyway, and we'd always been beaten by this team, uh, this other team, St. Bridget's, who Paddy Andrews was playing gotcha. for. Gotcha, okay. And uh, they always bet us, always bet, it was always us and them, and then you'd have maybe Croaks getting involved in the mix and Bally Bowden getting involved. And was Paddy Andrews your age group? Paddy Andrews, uh, I think Paddy Andrews was a year younger than us, okay. but he actually played for that age group. And, he was unbelievable at that age. Gotcha. He was one of the top players at that age. Uh, but we came back from that London trip, and that was the turning point for us at that at, 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 ju uh, at juvenile level. Why like, do you think that was? What did, what had changed or what happened? Did well, you just bond? 
the sport here in Ireland is like, um, I won't get into the big rigmarole of what I think about sport in Ireland here, but a lot of it is based on physical, uh, you know, your, your, your physical attributes. So the kids that are born a little bit earlier in the year will have probably the better opportunities in terms of going to academies and stuff like that. And that's in soccer as well as, as Gaelic football. So um, as I said, we were late developers, like we weren't as big as these lads, mm. and um, but we had fight in us. You know, we were from Ballymore, we were going playing matches and, you know, when we could play football, I think other clubs are kind of looking at us and saying, we just expected you to be physical and to be, you know, be dirty. And you aren't, you're actually footballers, because that's what Paddy instilled in us. But we just didn't have that. And, and I suppose when we got to the age of mine, when we were 17 and 18, we started to see a lot of lads take, you know, sports and, and, and that had an impact on how we could actually compete with the likes of St. Bridges. So we bet St. Bridges in the minor, we played them in a late game after after we came back from London. That was another turning point. That was us kind of going, yeah, we can beat this. And from that day on, that team I don't think ever got beaten after that, like up and until under 21. You won a minor championship? Uh, sorry, we didn't win that minor championship. We actually got beaten by, I think it was Chemical Croaks bet us that year. Okay. We had beaten Bridges. Maybe we thought when we bet Bridges that that was it. Like, you know, we, 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 we had it in the bag, but I think we got beaten by Croaks that year who are a really strong Southside team who wouldn't have played much Yes, because it was a Northside Southside team so they would have had a lot of lads playing rugby and stuff like that yeah. getting involved in the championship end of the season like so but yeah it was great experience at underage because um, there was so much more to winning uh, you know a lot of those lads went on to play on the 21s 13 of those lads went on to play senior football and winning a Dublin championship and a Leinster Championship in 2012. So yeah. 14 players from that team yeah. moved through to senior football, which is incredible. And that's a massive credit to the managers and the selectors mm. and the people around you that brought, because I know from minors, a lot of things can happen. Colleges, yeah. people not going to college, people get themselves involved in other sports, other things. So massive credit to for the Yeah, yeah. Paddy, Paddy Christie and Phil O'Day and there's, there's numerous managers that helped Paddy throughout the years. Um, it's very hard to explain how, how important that was to us because as I said there was players there you're talking about college mm. there was a group of fellas there from Ballymore who wouldn't, have, wouldn't have been in even in their sight okay unless it was for football unless they heard the glass Nevin lads talk about points yeah. and leaving cert in college yeah were you so, in college did you go to university I did but I went a little bit later than than most of my friends in terms of football and friends but uh, I was the first family member to go to college um i'd like to think then i helped some of my mates go to college after that and some of my family members so it was the it was a proud moment for me so yeah. that's what sport gives you you know you talk about winning and losing but to be able to feel a bit more a bit more comfortable in terms of going to college because you've spoken about it is, is incredible right okay so under 21s then now i will get into seniors when you were a minor did you play any senior football or when was your senior debut with ballymun I made my debut for Ballymun Kickham's uh, senior team when I was 16. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And was Ballymun Kickham's a senior team, Division 1 senior team at then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Now, it wasn't because I was an, an unbelievable footballer at that age, it was because we, we were struggling a little bit. Numbers, with numbers. okay. But, um, it was a league game, was it? Or? No, no, I played a full season uh, at when oh, I was full 16. Full season, not just yeah. a game? Yeah, full season. 16, yeah, right, yeah. okay. I made my championship debut when I was 16 as a corner forward. Wow. Yeah, so. Um, and it was great. Look, I was able to play with fellas that done a lot for me, the likes of Paddy Christie and Robertson and a lot of those senior lads, you know. Um, they were different times to what we have now and uh, the change room dynamics was completely different when you look back to, to what we have now, you know. Very good. Okay, so your 16 season debut. What year was that in? Oh, God. What was that? I'm so I get my years right. 35 now, so that's five. 14, 19 years ago. So I played 19 seasons with the senior team right, in okay. one, you know. So I'm building so. up to the big year, 2012. Yeah, 2012. Okay, so you were, what age were you in 2012? I was, um, was it 23, 24? Okay, 23, 24, so you yeah. had a good four, five, six seasons under your belt. Was yeah. there any success there at leagues? Any division one, the, a senior one well, leagues? Well, the, the, the key thing to that 2012 was that one like well first of all I, I, the, the cycle of playing senior for Ballymun was we were fighting for relegation first couple of years uh 
started to see some other young lads come through with me, um, Owen Dolan and these lads who played for Dublin as well, Alan Hubbard, Elliot Riley, Davy Bourne, all, all, all those lads came through and then uh, we started to compete in the league. Yeah. Like we were doing kind of okay in the championship but we never were able to compete to win it. But we, uh, we won a league, Division 1 league, that was a huge thing for us. And uh, we actually best St Plunkett's in that first one and that was a star-studded that's Brogan's team, yeah. So you had the, yeah. the three Brogan brothers. Uh, Jason Sherlock was playing, uh, Declan Lally was playing, Ross McConnell. So it was star studded, like, you know. And that was the, I suppose that that was the turning point for, for that senior team. Then we said, like, you know, the camel was off our back a little bit. And mm. uh, we were like, you know, why not go on and compete for championships? So all the way up till 2012 was the, was the key one. Um, Vincent's were a bit of the horn on our side like Bridges was when we were kids, you know. Vincent. Would Vincent's be rivals of your, the closest team? Yeah. Would there be a so, rivalry there? So we're in a hot spot, um, in particular the north side hot spot because we have Nafina uh, right, right down the road from us. We have Vincent's to the left of us and then we have Aidan's Oil who have also been mm. really good. And we've White Hall in that as well. Like So they're the 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 Aaron's Oil of I I think they got to an All Ireland final years ago. Uh, they're starting to redevelop now. You can see them starting to get a bit stronger in the under ages. Nafina have got you know played yeah. the Dublin Championship final this year and got beaten. They've been so, very close. So to they're getting them, stronger. Yeah. Uh, and Vincent's are coming back as well. Like they had a little bit of a drop off from the success they've had over the years. But yeah, so we're in the hot spot. Like yeah, you know. Okay, so plenty of teams around. So yeah. 2012. Straight in, uh, who you got to the county final? You beat. Uh, we played uh, Croaks, uh, and some of those lads we were beating in the minor were playing against us actually, and there were some of our Dublin teammates. Like, but yeah, but we played uh, a very good chemical Croaks that day, and uh, like the heavily decorated with Dublin players, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and you just had a, you just went on then with Leinster. Um, how many games did you have in Leinster? Three or two? Three. Uh, we had two, if I'm right. We had uh, we Shamrocks from Westmead. Okay. And we had um, we played the Kildare team. I think it was Sarsfields. Yeah. Could have been Sarsfields in the Leinster final. Gotcha. Um, we probably could have had three. I think three altogether. No, two. Two right. it was two. Yeah. And the finals in Croker was it? Finals in Croker, which was the old kind of way it was in it was in uh, it was on Paddy's day in 2013 so you basically played 2012 and yeah. it went all the way into 2013 so you never really got a break yes it was on Paddy's day the final wasn't it Paddy's day the whole of Ballymun was there it wasn't a great day now it was raining but uh, yeah the whole of Ballymun yeah. was there it was incredible like you know and who beat us in the final yeah uh, we got beaten by uh, Ross Common team and I'm gonna uh, oh Pierce's yeah. no um, mm. who did we get beaten by I don't really want to remember, to be honest. Desi Dolan's team. Right, okay. Uh, Desi Dolan, sorry, has cousins playing for the team. Gotcha. The Dolan's. Um, I'll get the name for you. Yeah, yeah. So, St. Bridget's. St. Bridget's, okay. Bridget's. Yeah. Um, How so could the, I forget St. Bridget's? St. So Bridget's. Who do you call the goalkeeper for them? Corin. Oh, he Some was a madman, wasn't he? Yeah, he gave us a bit of abuse that day, Arlie. He was good crack, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember him. He, was, he yeah. took a bit of penalties or a bit of 45s and stuff. He, I don't really want to talk to him about <laughs> that fella, to be honest, on this podcast, but yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We'll move Shane, on. Shane Curran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So now we're, so that was the last championship, the Ballymun Kickhams has won? Yeah, we were in a couple of finals. We were actually in the final the following year against, um, we got beaten by St. Vincent's that year. Yeah, but it would, have been, it would have been incredible to win it, and I, yeah, and we've look at we've we've tried to tried to get back there ever since, but it's it's been difficult because of uh, in 2020 20, 20 or twenty nineteen was it twenty twenty could have been twenty twenty or twenty nineteen we won a we won a Dublin championship, and um, I would be kind of confident that we would have went on to compete really well in the Leinster and 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 the all Ireland series, but obviously COVID was there. It was only club championship. It was only county championship and then it stopped, which gotcha. is unfortunate, you know. It was at one time, we had all the Dublin players back for the whole season, uh, which there was seven of them. Uh, I was one of them. So it was, uh, yeah, it was unfortunate that we didn't get to kick on and, and keep going because we had an unbelievable championship that year. 
Right, okay. And you're, you're, you're still playing club at the minute? Well, I played last year. I'm, I have a young Honestly. baby now, so I'm, uh, the commitments have changed a little bit. So I'm not sure about this year. Good stuff, good stuff. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to your, your Dublin debut. Um, you played county minors and county 21s? I did, yeah. I played two years minor, two years 21s. Right, okay. Yeah. And then your senior debut came in 2010? Eight. Eight? 2008. Okay. Yeah, 2008. Um, I played the Leinster Championship against Loud. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. And who was the manager that took you in for your Paul, first? Paul Caffrey was the manager that year. That was his last year as the Dublin senior manager. And then Pat Kilroy came in in 2009. Nine, okay. And then you used, did you many Lancers in 08, 09, 10? 08, 08 we won. 09. And then we lost to Mead in 2010. That was the year. That was semi final. Yeah. yeah, Mead bet loud where Joe Sheridan yeah. touched down. Infamous. Touched down on the goal line, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's that. And then 2010 was a good year for us. We we got to an All Ireland semi final against Cork. Five minutes to go, we, we thought we were an All Ireland final. We got beaten. They went on to be down in the All Ireland final. So, that was the catalyst for, I suppose, 2011. And uh, the turning point was. That was the turning point for us at that, that 2011 game. And in 2011, Pat Gilroy was, was still there? Pat Gilroy was still the manager, yeah. Um, I'd be in Pat's third year, third, third season involved as the manager. And um, we, uh, yeah, we, we got over the line against uh, great rivals, Kerry. Yeah, yeah. Were you playing that day? You I was, yeah, yeah. I came on that day. Um, I actually got a, I was playing an, against Leash in the Leinster Championship when I. Try, I kicked the ball out of the defence and a fella came in to block me and caught me in the knee and had basically a fracture on the inside of my knee. Um, so I, got, I, I played kind of, I wasn't meant to play that season, kind of got in towards the end of it, yeah. Right, okay. And when Cluxon hit that winner, uh, what was going through your head? Where were you on the pitch? Is it all just a blur? Uh, I was, <coughs> I think it was around halfway line. And um, I think at that point I was, just thinking if this doesn't go over what you're doing next yeah okay what's your next job you know focus on it because 2010 was a real eye-opener that we weren't playing uh in the present we were kind of thinking a little bit into the future of getting into an all iron final because i remember 2010 looking up in the scoreboard and saying you know what i'm going to be an all iron final it's going to be incredible dublin's going to be rocking mm. um and i think down might have played the day before so we knew we were going to play down so we were kind of like going to play down all in final but those things are like a split second in your head yeah. when you're playing a match. And I think we were three points up maybe, and all of a sudden we were knocked out. So 2011, we learned from that and we said, you know what, in my head, I don't know about the other lads, but I was thinking when Stephen was kicking that, if he misses this, what's the next job? If he scores this, what's your next job? Yeah. And that's what happened. He ran by me. I was like a robot, didn't see him run, running by me, like I was just looking, right, what, what am I doing next, you know? Great, great. So 2012, then Donegal caught you in the hop. That was in the semi-final? Yeah, was it Mayo or Donegal? Donegal, oh, was that 2014, sorry, 2012 Mayo. 2012, we got beaten by Mayo, and uh, yeah, that was a difficult year. That was Pat Gilroy's last year. Um, we just didn't show up that day at all, you know. I didn't start that game. I came on um, and yeah, we just didn't get going that day. Like, that's all I can really say about it. Yeah, right, okay. But you just made a men's then 2013. 2013, Jim Gavin's first year. Uh, I had played 2012 into the 2013 season with Bally Moon. I went back to, to, to play the 2013 season with Dublin and the guy that was in front of me, Kevin O'Brien, was playing mm -hmm. unbelievably well. So I was knocking at Jim's door a lot, you know, and playing the best football, playing, playing, playing. And he was like, look, the fella that's in front of you hasn't put a foot wrong. You are playing well, but I'm not, if you were in his shoes, I wouldn't like you to think that you could just give the jersey to somebody else. So that's fair enough. So I kept going, kept, uh, you know, making sure that I was, I think the key thing for me was 2011. I didn't get the chance to walk around the parade. It okay. was my goal. Yeah. If I ever get to play an all-around final, I'm going to walk around that parade. 2013, in the semi-final, we played uh, Kerry. And uh, 20 minutes in, James O'Donoghue was playing really well. 20 minutes in, I was I was called 
to, to go on, which is incredible. And Kevin O'Brien was marking? Kevin O'Brien was marking James O'Donoghue at that stage, so I got brought on then, 20 minutes in, and then played the All-Ireland Finals. Walked around the parade, played the All-Ireland Final in 2013, and yeah, we got the win as well. Great stuff, great stuff. So, uh, Jim Gavin, just want to touch on him. Obviously, he's a massive influence in, in Dublin, uh, GAA, and only the players, uh, whatever happened behind closed doors, I'm sure he's a great memories with them. Mm. What just stands out at the top of your head? What did he bring to, <coughs> to other managers, maybe? Not say Pat that didn't, but just stood out that made him so successful. Um, like I'm very interested in sports performance, you know, so it's only recent times that I've been able to reflect on the whole team mm -hmm. and the individuals that were involved in it, you know. And I think Jim, there's a couple of things he brought that stood out for me. First of all, his attention to detail. You'll hear, you'll hear a lot of people talk about that, so that's that's just something that's out there already. For me, how risk adverse he was. Okay. So I've been involved with other management teams in terms of performance coaching since I've retired and um, in different sports, and you wouldn't have that. I would have maybe organically felt that that would have been a natural thing. You know, because I was just in that environment for so long. Yeah. Other managers would have thought and preempted what was possibly going to happen. What he was doing all the time, he was constantly looking to see what was going to happen next. And maybe that happened because of 2014 after getting beaten by Donegal. Yeah. That he and the players felt that we weren't adaptable enough. You know. I need so a solution to everything. Any anything yeah, that's going to happen. His job in aviation is to is to uh, be risk adverse and to make sure that no big catastrophic disasters happen mm -hmm. like in an airplane. So he brought that and his military experience into yeah. the team. And on the pitch, would he be taking any of the drills or would he be stepping back? I've asked that on episode one about Mickey Hart and yeah. Sam. A bit. Yeah, he would have like, um, we had two brilliant coaches and uh, you know, Jason Sherlock was the offensive coach. Um, Declan Darcy was the defensive coach and they'd, they'd take the certain drills and and then Jim would get involved in them as well. And we'd have other coaches like Paul Clark was brilliant for us. Um, Mick Bowen was in was at one stage. Um, Mick Deegan has been brilliant coaches over the, over the tenure of Jim Gavin's time. So um, he'd always look to bring the best in for us, to give us the best exposure, to give us the best potential to, to want to win something. Very good, okay. So we touched on 2014. Donegal just caught us in the hop, probably something is been prepared for or? Well, the thing with Donegal was that we knew they were going to be very defensive and they were going to get behind the ball. So in the first half, we'd done okay. Like, you know, we, we'd, we'd scored a couple of long distance scores. We knew it was going to be a low scoring game. And we'd, we'd scored a few from long distance. Damon Connie scored one or two. I scored one from long distance. And it was, we kind of had, had them figured out a little bit. And we pushed up on them. Yeah. And uh, once we pushed up on them, we knew we could get after that kick out and anything else. And then just before half time, I think they kicked the big long ball in maybe, or I can't remember the goal, but they got a goal anyway. And it brought the game a bit tighter at half time. So at half time, anybody would have said, well, what worked in the first half? Well, what worked was actually pushing up on them mm -hmm. and, and uh, being a bit more composed when they're taking our shot selection and stuff like that. And unfortunately that was the opposite of what we needed going out, you know, because in the second half when we went out, we did push up. I think I was an alien half forward line for some of the kickouts because um, I might have been marking Michael Murphy that day. I don't know who I was marking, but I was pushed out and they just banged it down the middle. And when they banged it down the middle, we were up too high. We were chasing backwards instead yeah. of being facing the game and yeah. defending that way. And they got the three goals. Right. Okay. I mean, that's probably a credit to Jim then too, obviously just changing up at half time, going long, and then just having fell for them that day. Yeah, yeah, and they've tried it a couple of times yeah. since that. Yeah, a lot know, of teams would do that once yeah. you, like the likes of Donegal, begging as well. Mm. The goalkeepers now, Morgan, they're able to hit those massive long kickouts to break that uh, pushing up. Well, specifically if it, uh, it didn't happen then, but teams start to become more tactically astute and they start to go more zonal. Mm -hmm. And one way to, to combat that was to go long. Yeah. Go down long because your, your two wing backs pushed up high. So if you go long and you get the break of the ball, can you then exploit the space that's in behind? So um yeah, that's that's you'll see it happen today, but but we got caught out that day and but <laughs> to lose that and then to win the next six was incredible. Yeah. 
now those six years where I think from an outsider from not Dublin we were looking is this ever going to stop but mm. some people it had it had to come to an, an end uh, at some stage where um, once upon a time we thought that who's going to stop them who's not but then it did end in 2000 and just last 20, year two, two years ago yeah 2021 2021 yeah yeah, yeah. and, and the, out of those six finals did you play how many did you play all of them oh you played all you started no. all of them N oh. um, no I didn't uh, I didn't start the 20 the last one was just 2020 and then 2021 was it 2019 2020 2020 was the Covid year Toronto, wasn't it 2020 2019 was we played Toronto in the final I think he's beat right? 2018 he's played uh, Tyrone beat Monaghan in 2018 in the semi-finals. You only was, remember games by, Tyro uh, by Monaghan. By Monaghan, Monaghan also teams. <laughs> but uh, 2018, I think he's, he's beat Tyrone. Um, but that was the year. So 20, that was the last, 2019, that would have been the year we played Kerry and we, we drew with them and we played them in a replay. Is that right? And then yeah. 2020 then was our last all and we lost 2021, 2022, yeah. 2022, yeah. yeah. So the last two I didn't start. Right, okay. Now you had a big year out of all those years. You're going to probably look back at 2015 as being the standout year for you. Don't know. Yeah, like, I mean, 2015 was, was brilliant in, in that I, the amount of game time I had and, and how I played and what way, I, kind of style of the way I played, I suppose, was big for me. Like, and the players I marked was yeah. were big names. 2016 was... 2016 was probably when you look at the players I marked was probably a bit diff more difficult. Like you right. know, you're nominated for football of the year in 2015. Yeah, 2015 uh, got nominated for uh, football of the year myself. Uh, Bernard Brogan and Jack, Jack McCaffrey. Jack won it. Was, Jack won it. Jack yeah. won it. Okay. So yeah, look at that was I'm sure that was um, a big one for you that night. Did you, now the football yeah. of the year? I heard a podcast there. I think it was actually yeah. Paddy Andrews and James Donahue talking about it. Are you told before that night if you get it or not? Yeah. Or, you are yeah. told, so you know going into it. Yeah, well, if you didn't get told, you know, you didn't win it. <laughs> right, okay, so those uh, who... I, I, a lot of people think it's, it's a, like, I suppose when you win it, yeah. it's one of those things that you can say, oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I would have liked him to win it was because of my family, maybe. Gotcha. Or my coaches that I've had, or my club to have a player of the year, like, you know. Um, but I didn't really have that, like, it, doesn't really give me that energy that yeah. I would have had, and it's a cliche thing, then winning an All-Ireland. Honest to God, I, I, I say that, you know, I, I'm not bullshitting you. I didn't really, like, I knew if I was ever going to be in a chance to win a uh, Player of the Year, that I'd very, I, I'd, it'd be hard for me to win it. Why? Because it's all the other players vote for you. Yeah. <laughs> so if, you, if I'm up against a fella that's a forward or, fellow that probably doesn't have to get physical, you know, because mm -hmm. he's a defender. Why would people vote for me? Yeah. Like if I, if I, if you're playing for Monaghan and I'm getting stuck into you mm -hmm. and you're telling yeah, yeah. your teammates, absolutely. this is what he's doing to me, why are you going to vote for me? No, absolutely, yeah. So I'm never going to win it. So I never really, the only way you could, a Dublin player at that point would have won an, uh, a player of the year is if there's other Dubs involved in it. Gotcha. Right, okay, very good. So, yeah, so you played your last game for Dublin in 2021. 2021, yeah. Yeah, you're throwing all these dates at there's me. A lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of dates going on here. 2021 was my last, uh, last game for Dublin. I hadn't played one minute in the championship. Okay. And I played 40 minutes in all in semi finals, which is crazy. Like. Right, okay. And you're yeah. enjoying retiring my life from the county scene at the minute? Yeah. Yes, no, yeah. Going, no going back. I met one of the lads last night, just in the shopping center and uh, and he said to me he, says, he, says, he had a gear bag and I says you going train and he says yeah and I says Jesus it's cold and wet it was like oh, I didn't you don't miss that I don't miss that like, you know don't it's miss that because this time of the year particularly when we were doing well we wouldn't have we wouldn't have trained this time of the year yeah all the other counties would have because we were lucky to win and have a break and then go away in around Christmas time and start back in January mm -hmm. so I I always thought that was the right structure because the loading on the body the amount of teams that are going back really early but the split season now do you not feel as if they need to go back early because well they were knocked out already they were knocked out um in july like, yeah. so they need to go back yeah. you know they definitely need to go back but 
uh, we didn't have to go back. Yeah, because, because you'd wanted we to played at the later end of the gotcha, season, yeah. got to the very end of it, and then we had the we had the holiday as well. You know, very good. Today's episode is kindly sponsored by Whoop. Whoop is a device that I've been using for years, which monitors my recovery, sleep, training, and health, and gives me personalized recommendations and coaching feedback. Whoop analyzed my key metrics like HRV and rest and heart rate to determine a daily recovery score and shows me how lifestyle and training behaviors affect my recovery. Top GA athletes at county and club level are using Whoop daily to take the guesswork out of their training. Based on your recovery, you'll get a daily target exertion goal to help avoid overtraining and undertraining. I have left a link in the description box for you to sign up for a free month to use towards your off-season training and recovery. Okay, so moving on to the first segment of the episode, the 16 quick fire questions, and these are quick fire now. Reason being 16, que 16 questions, uh, replicating 16 weeks for the club uh, off-season, okay? So straight up, favorite singer, band, musician? Genre of music even. Oh, I'm a mixed bag. I'm a mixed bag, like a big house house music fan. I like play the that, saxophone yeah. to the to house music, but uh, I'm a Damien Dempsey fan. I'm Dame Kennedy fan, like Aslan. I'm kind of. Would there been music in the dressing room before games in Kroger yeah. and stuff? Yeah. Who's controlling it? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know who it is now, but yeah. I think there's some versatile shown in there a couple of times. There was there? at the end, yeah, at the end of it, there was, yeah. So I'd have the tunes, uh, basically for the tunes from the gym, I would use for playlists, uh, Spotify, head out, you know. Good stuff. Uh, death row meal. So, death row meal has to be steak. Steak and chips, steak veg and or chips, yeah. You're going pretty healthy for yeah. steak <laughs> and chips. Yeah, <laughs> steak. Uh, steak lover. So moving on now at the minute, favorite takeaway order. Favorite takeaway order. Uh, it'd probably be a toy. Toy. A toy. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. your order there? Yeah, toy green chicken. Toy green curry chicken here. Yeah. yeah. I, I like Indian as well. I'm not a big takeaway person. I'm sweet. I have a sweet tooth. That's right. my killer, you know. Right, okay. Favourite holiday destination? Santorini. Nice. Mm. Hot. Yeah, lovely. Favourite pair of boots? New Balance. Oh, there was a deal going on there in the yeah, dubs. I remember, yeah, yeah. was it Connolly and Brogan that was wearing them? Were you one of yeah, them? I was no. wearing them, yeah, yeah. They were yeah. blue, they come out, but they yeah. haven't really been around since, have they? So we were all wearing different boots. I'd, so uh, I'd been wearing Umbro, and then I went to, uh, sorry, Adidas Umbro, then I went to, uh, what was the other? Warrior. Yeah. And then New Balance. But right. New Balance for me would have confused, yeah. I actually was reading Bart Brogan's book. I don't know how true this is, but he mentioned that any ambassador stuff at the start of the season that the Dublin players would have got, rather than taking the money themselves, mm. they would have put it into a pot. Mm. Was that true? Percentage of it, yeah. Right, and then yeah. you'd use it at the end of the year for something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you'd, have, you'd have like any kind of... That's different, that's good. Yeah, yeah, just because to be lads that wouldn't probably do as much, maybe they're only new onto the squad, so it just gave, yeah, it just, it, it just I suppose, it shared the load, like, you know. Very good. Um, morning routine at the moment. At the moment. Well, it's just Wake changed. up, yeah, it's feed Lennon, make sure he's all right for us, that's my son, and uh, like, it would have been totally different when I was playing, but now it's kind of, and when you were playing, was there one routine that you always done? I know you're big in here. Yeah, when I was when I was when I was playing, it was totally different. I'd get up and I'd stretch. I'd, I'd run out the front with the dogs. I'd have a pint of water with uh, cider vinegar and yeah. salt in it, and I'd do mad shit when I was when I was playing. Like compared to what I do now, with, you know. Did you do any journaling? Gratitude. Um, I would have done a little bit of journaling when I went to work. Like that was my first thing I'd done when I got to the office. I'd start to journal. Um, but you're constantly thinking, even when you're in work, you're constantly thinking of what you're eating, what you're, mm. what you're, how much you're working, because you're going to train at five o'clock. Yeah, you're doing all so, your meal prep, were you, or was there companies yeah, and stuff? Or? Well, I have my own oh, food yes. company that does a lot of that, so I had those three meals a day, so that was all boxed off for me. But um, yeah, so so totally changed to when I played. Good stuff. Uh, so most underrated player you have marked, maybe one that doesn't stand out. If there's one off the top of your head. Underrated player. 
I always struggle with this question because when you say underrated, it kind of you're you're you're, you're nearly. Well, you're expecting someone to say, say he's not underrated. Yeah, well, you're expecting to say the Gooch and you know all these big names. Yeah, James Donahue back in, in fourteen. That like all these football yeah, years. They were stuff. right. I think they were lads. All right. I, I was. Anybody that surprised you? Um, there's a couple of lads that like played in the counties that were probably not competing to win all Ireland's that were very good that mm. were like they were never going to be given given the exposure unless yeah. the county got further on down the line. But the likes of Connor Cox off Ross Common was yeah. very good. The Morta brothers over that side. I think um Mickey Newman and Mead was very good. Tall, big, um very agile. Who else was there? Um there's a good few, like, but like, mm. I know what you I, mean. I, yeah, I, I, mar- I, I marked a lot of players that were, you know, I've played in Division One a long time, so I marked a lot of fellas that would be rated. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Maybe already rated as best as the others that are highly rated. I don't know, but the lads that I've mentioned there definitely were players that I would have rated. Yeah. Uh, most embarrassing moment in GA? Anything stands out? Most embarrassing moment. These are hard questions. <laughs> Not too quick fire, are they? No. Most embarrassing moment. You didn't forget your boots or anything? A couple of lads, I remember horror stories of, of boys forgetting boots. Or it's probably not my story that I was embarrassed about, but I've definitely, it's, I don't even know if he, this fellow was embarrassed. I remember Mick McCauley, we played a league game and Aslan were playing at half time. We were going out and he actually got his jersey signed. Right, okay. And he played? He played with the jersey signed, like. Aslan Who signed it? The, Aslan. Oh, the, the they were in the change room as we were walking out. <laughs> they were in the little change room. He was, Mick was, yeah. And he played the second half with it on. I think he had a sign down the bottom or something. He had a tuck in or something That's strange mad. like that, yeah. Uh, Nothing embarrassing happened though. That's a good enough that story, I like that one. Yeah. Uh, pre-game ritual, are you superstitious? Not really. Um, the only thing I would have done was I would have visited me, me brother and me dad's grave, that's all. Okay. Mm. Um, now, do you track performance or are you old school? Obviously, you probably wore GPS and stuff, but you mm. personally, did you have a whoop, for example? I uh, didn't have a whoop, no. Um, I believe I'm getting one today after this <laughs> We interview. can work something. No, no, but the, um, I would have tracked everything. I would have tracked everything. Um, How did you track that? Was, was there a polar Garmin? The physical stuff. The yeah. physical stuff would have been, obviously, the, the volume stuff would have been through the GPS right. that we would have worn. Um, we would have a guy specifically looking after our, you know, the no, volume of running we were doing, and um, he was excellent. And uh, the other stuff the, the, that wasn't physical, the you know, performance stuff on the pitch, I would have measured a lot. Like so, I would have measured like if I was playing a match, if I if I was playing a an AVB match, mm-hmm. I would have watched the video back, and I would have seen how many players we would have been, we would have we would have had. And how many times did my man touch the ball in that play? Uh, how many shots do you have in the play? Or how many assists? Let's you say write this had. all down in, in a have all that loud book. And was yeah. that right over the years? As I, I learned as I got on, like, you know, okay. and uh, I would have documented everything in terms of meetings, what we would have, what would be said in the meetings. Um, I would have had my own diary for the years, a couple of years. Like, it's know. really interesting for young people. Yeah, um, in, diary to everything in terms of yeah, that, that was crucial for me because I could then go to the manager and say, if he said to me, you're not playing because of this reason, I'd say, look. Yeah, right, okay. There's my stats there. You know, all, all well and good, the physical stuff, but look, this is the fellow I marked. This is where he's touched the ball. This mm. is how many times he's touched the ball. This is how many times he scored. This is how many times he took a shot. And also I knew it was my own responsibility that I could look at myself and go, yeah. I can't go near the manager. You deserve not to start. Yeah. Look it. And that's that's crucial for young players nowadays that they realise that you have the power. You know, you're going to the odd time get someone that personally probably doesn't pick you because they like the other fellow more. Mm-hmm. So, but at the top level, it yeah. doesn't happen. Very good. That's really interesting. Okay, so uh, daytime or nighttime game? Nighttime game. Okay. Last minute win goal or last minute win block? Block. Okay. Uh, toughest marker or probably the you've done the marking? Toughest fellow I've marked. Mm. Conor Callan. Okay. Um, now Conor Callan, I'm sure he's just direct, fast, strong, balanced, smart. The hardest fellas to mark, if you're a young person now and you're saying, give me one magic power, balance. 
balance, right. change of direction. Change direction, kick off both feet. Like if I mark a fella that's predominantly left foot or predominantly right foot, I know where I want to push him to. Yeah. Because I can, we're all habits, like we're all habitual. Like So um, if you really study somebody, you'll be able to see the runs they make all the time, the, the tricks that they may have, the step. And the, the top players, you can't, it's like a game of poker. It's very hard to read. Yeah. And if you find it very hard to read them, then it's very hard to prepare for them. Yeah. Because um, you don't know what they're going to throw in next, you know? So mm. there's fellas that I've marked, I'd always mark a certain shoulder. If the ball was coming in, I'd push them to the side that I want to go. Because it's a habit. Like, it's like someone, you know, uh, it's like, do you know when you sit and you hold your hands one way and you go, well, fold the other way and it Absolutely. feels weird. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do in a game. Gotcha. Very interesting. Okay. Um, and then most influential person in your GA career? Paddy Christie. Okay, very good. And last one, finally, Alan or Bernard Brogan? <sighs> For what? <laughs> For playing alongside. Playing alongside. I used to mark Alan Brogan, and this is what we used to do. So Alan used to know I liked to play football as a fullback. Okay. Alan used to love Roman. Yeah. And he'd start, let's say, inside, like between the full forward line and half forward line, and he'd say to me, come on, go on, Roman. The two of us go out the pitch. So I loved Mark and Alan Brogan. I loved Mark and Bernard Brogan because he, at that, he was one of the best players full forwards in the country, and uh, we had serious battles, me and him, like you know. And he stayed inside. He wouldn't roam. No, he's close to goal, and once he gets that ball, yours, you have to keep him off the ball. Yeah. Because once he gets that ball, he literally needs probably two inches of separation. He's kicking yeah. over the bar. He's like, even if you're just about to block him, he's kicking that over the bar. You know, that's how good he was. But um. Alan, so answer your question, Alan. Alan didn't like the gym. Bernard, Bernard uh, did a little bit. Uh, but who do I, as a player, that, you can't say that. Like, tell <laughs> me if the two of them are full forwards, I'd say. If you had to that. play one, one's injured. All Ireland if, final. If you had to play one of them, it's a stupid question. It's a stupid question. <laughs> okay, we've got Paul there. Paul Brogan I'd rather have than the, just out of three of them. Paul Brogan. Brogan. Paul Brogan. Yeah. Right, Philly, so moving on to the next segment. Um, you're injured at the minute, so we're unable to do the shooting challenge, which I think you would have given a, a right rattle. I it's, think so, yeah. It yeah. in the 40 yard dash, how do you think you would have had it went? I probably would have done better in the shooting than the 40 yard dash. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, look, I, I actually was, when when the when the Dublin lads were playing with Dublin this year, uh, I was actually the free taker for Paddy Mon, so. Okay. So, I don't know, maybe I would have done better. <laughs> Good stuff, you might come back for a part two next year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no Keelan Mooney as well has to come back. Now he finds himself in the 40 yard dash, so. Right, right. Who knows, um, we'll get you back. So, instead of that, like we did with Keelan, we have two clips here I want to go through with you. We'll put the clips on the YouTube video as well. This is, you take this. You've scored a lot of scores in your time but yeah. all I can remember is maybe you have a number three or number four on your back how are you possibly getting up the pitch so often uh, it wasn't always like that a lot of down yeah it wasn't always like that I suppose when I was uh, starting my career um, I was a corner forward so when I played Dublin minor I was corner forward and um, I suppose that stood to me then in my later career to be able to get up the pitch and score for points but yeah, there was a transition there where I had to prove that I could do that. That I had to prove to teammates and managers that I was a threat and I was a threat going forward and that I could supply the, the forwards with good ball if I was in a position in the pitch that I could do that. And uh, yeah, depending on the manager, I suppose, like I, when I was playing under Pat Gilroy, he wouldn't let me, he wouldn't let me go past the 45 metre line. So um, I think there was a game in particular where he, uh, he took me off because I went past the 45 meter line twice, you know, so. Totally against it. Yeah, he was against it. Um, you know, that's that was his style. He wanted players to do a specific job and you stuck, ste stepped outside that, you, you paid the consequences, which I did that day. But I suppose Jim, um, over time, would have seen that I was an extra threat going forward. So the opposition had an extra forward being defender to think mm -hmm. about. Um, and not focus on probably the six forwards that were there to an extent uh, as they would if there was no one coming from from deep like you know or from midfield yeah. so that yeah that was a massive asset to have i'm sure there's other cornerbacks in yeah. contention with you trying to battle for your your place mm. and if you're able to get one or two scores that's that's huge well the other thing was that the that management team particularly james manager team and deck darcy who was my defensive coach knew that there was also a, def a defensive element to me attacking okay because 
at that stage they were like, look, we want you to mark specific players. It's a big one there was Gooch, is it? This is the one, yeah. 2015. Where, that's 2015, yeah. where yeah, brought Gooch up the pitch a good he bit. He scored a lot actually at points against Monaghan. There's Monaghan there, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of five yeah. or six there. I think there's a couple of times where... Goals too. Yeah, a few goals. No, look, I was very lucky to have teammates around me that um, knew I could get up and kick a point, you know, and they were giving me the ball. Like Some defenders <laughs> probably wouldn't give them the ball in shooting positions, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, look, uh, looking back on that now, it'd be nice to see how many tackles and blocks and the yeah. stuff I was really um, supposed to be doing, I suppose, as a defender, but it's nice, isn't it, to have those, those uh No, a lot of highlights. scores there. And another thing we're really good at was getting involved in little scuffles and you were fond of the tunnels. Yeah, I like and the tunnels, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to bring these up a couple here. I've actually three. Right, I was not hundred percent sure if you were involved in all three of them, but I want you to talk me through here and what do you remember? Now I think this is 2010. This is a, a fair back one. I think Conley's involved there. Conley's probably not too far away from a couple of them. I'm a bit of amnesia. I don't remember any of this to be honest. No, don't remember anything. No, that's, you're not involved. Ah, no. Uh, <laughs> me and Michael Shields had a bit of a row in the tunnel there that year, and uh, I actually, uh, that's the second one there now, so. I'll pause that one. Yeah. Like, we use, like, I look at, I know I, I, I play as well, a coach as well. People looking at this are all going to be GAA supporters and mm. But that happens on the pitch, it's going to stay on the pitch. That happens to start showing through the roof for every, everybody's. Uh, 100 miles an hour it's a physical game and yeah. it does spill in the tunnel uh yeah. tunnel stuff is there anything psychologically now that you're, you're stepped away from the county kind of scene that maybe it, who would get be better off the the, the team is starting the argument in the tunnel would that help the team or a look back at the galway armad for example this year yeah. did that help armad did that help galway more so was, was there any psychological reason why he maybe got involved in that stuff in the tunnel yeah well like uh Michael Shields in that particular uh, incident would have been probably the cork enforcer. Like, you yeah. know, um, I really liked Michael Shields. I think he was bred from the same cloth I was. Um, I'd been on, I think I'd been away with him in the All Stars and stuff like that. So I actually got to know him really well. And and I think we just died each other up after he hit the dam there. And I think Bernard, and I said to myself, right, you're. You're the, the bit of hard stuff on that side. Right. I'll be the bit. I, I'll try uh, support my teammates, my side, and I think the two of us just looked at each other and went, "Let's go." You yeah, know? yeah. Um, who got the better psychological edge? I don't think anybody in that stage. Like maybe we did, and that it didn't impact them or Bernard as much. Um, and me and him are probably used to, mm -hmm. you know, being able to deal with situations like that. So there's other situations that I'd say was different. So that video there, the second one is the Mayo one. Yeah, you weren't um, playing that, were you a, I wasn't, sub? no, no. Um, yeah, and I just remember Derm O'Connor missed a free and I remember saying to myself, you know what, um, I'll just remind him that he missed the free. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how it started? That's how it started. And uh, I was, actually worked really well because and there's people that are going to watch this or listen to this and say like they, they, don't, they don't like those type of incidents or tactics or whatever it may be but all i wanted them to do was think of me a little bit going to that change yeah. room and, and not having to think about the information they needed to take on yeah. board so o'connor seemed to be okay with it but then i think higgins pushed me and then i think o'shea pushed me which is that captain yeah. so when that captain gets involved i'm like I'm at the grab and trade, at the tension of the trade, their, their players. And uh, Higgins wasn't playing at that time. I think he was coming to the end of his career, but I'm sure he would have been vocal in the change room yeah. with his experience that he had. So I would like to think that in that moment in time, something would have changed in that change room. And I think it did. I think the second half in that game, I think that third quarter we done really well. I mm -hmm. think we scored. I think that's the own marching goal. Was that the game? Is that the game? Well, that, that sure. I'm not sure. I think. No, well, I, well, I remember the second, second half. Um, like when you go in a half time, and just that 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 that's happened. Your energy, your adrenaline, everything is up, and you're you're like 
as pen, depending on how many lads are involved in that, yeah. there was more lads from Mayo involved in that then. And this is not just being like yeah, yeah. biased towards Dublin, but no. there was three around me there from yeah. Mayo. I think most of the Dubs lads were gone in. And uh, I was just laughing like, because I knew they were going to be like the, the, the level of energy that, that would have went up in their change room at half time would yeah. have been so. So they were going to come out with something. And all we needed to do was be calm. Yeah. And, and controlled and focused on what we we're doing. So if you if you get a, a someone pushes you or hits you or smack in the game, your nervous system goes all over the place. Yeah. So there's no way they were going to be thinking of what they should have been doing. So and that was a split second. That wasn't preempted no. the day before or anything like that. But uh, I just knew that psychologically we could affect them. That and there's just that. one more, and I actually don't know if you're involved at all, but this is a big one here with... But if I'm not involved, I'm, you're going to put me in anyway, mm. aren't you? Well, you but no people involved, this maybe. This is Tyrone. Now, the cameras weren't probably in the best place there. Were you involved there at all? I was there. <laughs> I'm not saying that. No. I was there. Um, sometimes you got to appreciate maybe a couple of lads maybe going know at it, happened. you know? Well, look... It's certainly you'd rather that be on the pitch than going at it like, Probably, in yeah. terms of in terms of playing football. But yeah. in that situation, um I remember I played that that year was Desi Farrell's first year and I played I played the first league game against Kerry. I was supposed to be marking Clifford. And then they said to me two days before that if Walsh plays, you're gonna have to take Walsh. Tommy Walsh. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to be the target man. So Walsh, I marked Walsh that day. Had a, I had a for my first game of the season, I was happy um, with my performance. The next day, I went for recovery, had food, went home. We'd only been back from Bali a couple of weeks, and everybody gets this Bali belly where your food and yeah. drink and whatever you're, you know affects your digestive system. Put it that way, and I was in bits. Um, that morning, I was like, my stomach's in bits here. Like, I'm getting just married by the cramps. And my wife said, you know, it's probably like just from Bali, like, you know? And I was like, oh, it's not stopping. Like, it's constant. And I uh, went to the hospital and uh, had to get my appendix out. Yeah, I know that feeling. So I got my appendix out and that kept me out for four or five games. And I remember coming back, I was ready to go for the Donegal game in that league campaign. And Desi said to me, no, we want you ready for the Toronto game. I was just killed, so done me extra bit of work, ready for the following week. And he didn't start me that, I was disappointed to be honest, he didn't start me against that, that Tyrone game. I loved playing Tyrone. Right, I loved okay. playing them. I loved the, the way they played. Uh, I would feel that it always brought the best out of me, that physicality mm -hmm. element. Um, I just loved, I just loved it. I loved, I loved playing against them, um, especially up there. I yeah. loved the environment, I loved Alma. And it was a sloppy night. It was so bad. I'd asked the question, why was I not starting? I spoke to one of the selectors and he said, look, we're trialing this lad. We want to see what he's like. I said, fair enough. Thanks for the, that's, that, that's what I want. I don't want any bullshit. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. Great, Grant got, got that information. And it was, yeah, it was bad. The weather was bad. And a half time, I don't know how it kicked off, uh, but it did, it kicked off. And I remember being in the front, in the front of it, and myself and Noel Scully were here, <laughs> and all the dumb lads are here, and all the turn lads are there, and it was, it was a free for all. Just chaos. It was a free for all. It was like give and get. You can't stand everybody off. Get, you're gonna get a few digs. And you're gonna take a few yeah. as well. But I remember it was like the Homer Simpson one. Only <laughs> slips in in between the. It goes into the bush. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like that. You had to be like throwing a few back in, <laughs> throwing a few back in. You know. But uh, the Tyrone boys are giving it as well now. In fairness, I remember yeah, poor Mick Fitz uh, wouldn't be the biggest uh, fighter in yeah. the group. <laughs> He's over in the corner, con. He was caught on the other side of the battlefield, basically in the corner. I was. I remember going in the half time, thinking, "Is he all right?" Like you know, because <laughs> he was just in with the Tyrone lads, and I was like, "Someone get him over this side." Uh, look, these things have happened. You've seen what happened last year with Galway and Armagh. Mm -hmm. The simple solution is get them to go in at different times. If yeah. you don't want it to happen, very rarely does someone get really hurt in these situations because there's so many people there. Uh, you've got lads, you've got bravado, you've got fellas fighting for their jersey, you've mm. got a teammate getting a little hit, you're not going to stand back, you'll, you'll, you'll look like a coward. Mm -hmm. So that's why melees happen, specifically in a tight environment like a tunnel. Yeah. Um, if the GA want to eradicate it, 
stopped and gone at the same time. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so Philly, I know you've done interviews in the Late Late Show, I know you've come out with your book, um, but for this chat, I want to really really dive in more so on the football side mm. of things and focus on it. If anybody's interested in uh, the interview, the Late Late interview, uh, spoke very well on that, your, your book. Um, I haven't got around to reading it myself for a great reviews. So you're very open, very honest. Um, but I do want to just dive in a wee bit. You're doing good work at the minute with Mount Joy. Do you want to talk a little bit about that briefly? Yeah, so uh, I've been working in Mount Joy, I'd say pre-COVID for about three years. We're back in there now since uh, everything is open back up. And yeah, so we run a basically um, kind of a connection leadership program in there. Uh, at the minute, we're actually doing something really interesting. It's it's a, it's a thing for RTE. It's a it's a show a series called Me Machines where okay. the prison guards will be playing the prisoners. Is that so out yet? Is that it's gonna it's gonna be uh, out in March. Deadly, okay. March or April, yeah. Brilliant. So the prison guards. So we're we're basically looking at trying to show society that like these are people that have made mistakes, and what's really important now is what they do in the future and for young people to look in and say, I don't really want to go that route, or maybe I'm going that route, but I, after watching that, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so the uh, diversion type kind of series, but also to show kind of the underlying issues why these lads have kind of went this route in life. You know, I think it's going to be crucial that like, so society, society sees this because uh, some of their stories are incredible. Very good. No, that, that's that's brilliant. Really looking forward to that. So yeah. next March, April time. Next March, yeah. Next March, we're hoping that. And you played matches now. Yeah, yeah. So we played a match the other day against the Dubs. Uh, oh right, okay. Dubs and uh, don't want to give too much away here. I can't give too much away, but they played a seven aside tournament, a seven aside game in in, Mount, in actually Mount Joy. Brilliant. And, and they have and facilities uh, up there pitching all do they? The yards, yeah. So we got goalposts in, and they played, and all the prisoners were watching. And so <laughs> it was, it was, it was brilliant. Yeah. Was there many Vinnie Jones characters? Was there? Uh, I can't say. Can't yeah, we'll say. Get you'll, there. Have to wait. you'll have to wait for it. Very good, yeah. very good. Look forward yeah. to that. Yeah. So, we're here in your gym, B Do 7. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you before we, we started the camera what that, what that uh, stood for, but yeah. I wanted to ask you here. Yeah. So, where's the name come out of? Where's the number come out of? Uh, so, so, basically, um, B Do, it's, it's, it's taken from a business analogy. It's B by Do equals half. Um, and so so we've changed it into if you want to be something you got to do it and if you do it you'll have it and what we want people to have is a number seven and a seven is our system which is basically a venn diagram where we look at people's movement we look at people's uh, strength functional strength and we look at their body composition and if you can imagine a venn diagram you have one three and five and yeah two four and six and seven is in the middle gotcha so if you're a number seven it means you move well you're strong and you're lean brilliant and that's that maintenance phase we want people to get to. Love it, okay. And how long has it been open? We're running now about 15 plus years now, yeah. Brilliant. So I uh, started off in an attic space in Ballymun Kickhams, training uh, one team, started training their parents, four or five of their parents, and then got to the stage where we're in an 8,000 square foot premises now with five concepts. So what we're trying to do is bring all the best training boutique studios that we've seen in the UK, Dubai, and the US Brilliant. under the one roof. And eventually, we're, it's basically like a shop window. We're trialing these concepts to see how well they work. And then we want to take it to the market. Great. That's a fantastic setup. We did a bit of a tour at the start. No, very, very, very impressed. Um, you're also, are you still doing a little bit of S&C with teams? I know in the past you've done Dublin Camogie, mm. Soccer, Shamrock Rovers earlier on, maybe 10 yeah. years ago. With Bose, are you, you're doing? I'm doing? I've just finished this season okay. doing performance coaching with Bose. I, re, I really, uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, we do. Yeah, I, I specifically don't do S&C with teams anymore, but the yeah. staff members do. Um, and yeah, I'm more into now kind of that performance. Mental performance more so. Industry, yeah, I, I love it. Well, environmental performance, cultural performance. Um, so it's basically like looking at the environment and looking at the individuals within that and trying to get them to the next level. Brilliant, brilliant. So um, you also mentioned in the episode NutriQuick. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about it. You, when did you start that or was it a I partnership? Uh, well, I, I set up my own company, Fifth Field, in 2012 and basically merged my company with a bigger company called NutriQuick. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's gone really well. We're in most retail stores. We have, uh, I think we have roughly around 
between 30 and 50,000 meals a week going out to Aldi alone. Brilliant. Um, so it's, it's doing really well at the minute and uh, keeps me healthy every day having a few of them. Good you stuff. Know, Brilliant. Episode four. Thanks very much, Philip. Thank you.